Hey, Nils, uh, thanks for joining us again. And I hear that you're currently working from a different location than usual, not your uh, water house. Water I am, I am. I'm, I'm, I'm dressed to the occasion. I'm on the Caribbean right now, Curaçao. It's uh, a small island just north of Venezuela, close to uh, uh, the Latin continent. It's part of the Dutch kingdom, and this is where I hang out in the winters to uh, enjoy uh, sunshine, as you can see by the color of my face, oh, and uh, nice temperatures, the sea, and some PPC work. Yeah, rough life. Um, and I think the, uh, the flexibility and you being able to do anything from anywhere, clearly that has a lot to do with automation and technology. And you're one of the big scripts guys in the world. Um, that's what you teach people. So, uh, so remind folks a little bit about like, what's your main PPC angle besides like scripts and automation? Right. Yeah. So I, I basically run what I call a remote PPC agency. It's a boutique agency with roughly 20 international clients. Uh, eight part-time contractors that support me in doing the job. And I was able to scale the agency to a very decent size, uh, mostly thanks to automation and scripts so that I could create more value for my clients without needing to scale uh, headcounts. I'd also create a lifestyle that allows me to enjoy a uh, winter time in, in the Caribbean and still uh, go surfing, uh, e e even in a Black Friday season. I, I think you are living the dream, my, my friend. So... Um, yeah, hopefully a lot of people watching this episode and learning from Niels and what he does with scripts and automation and tools. And the angle that we wanted to take today was actually talk a little bit about what OpenAI announced at their dev day. And so obviously OpenAI, most people should know about it, but that is the company behind ChatGPT, the thing that really popularized Gen AI or generative AI. And uh, you and I, we talked about that a couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago. But at these Dev Day or at the Dev Day, they announced a slew of new stuff. So I wanted to cover some of what they announced and what you think is exciting and what you've been doing with it. Um, but yeah, so so that's the topic for today, Gen AI and all the new stuff from OpenAI. But before we dive into like what's new from OpenAI, maybe the, the latest thing that most people have heard about is all the drama that's been happening in San Francisco. So Neil, you want to talk us through who's currently in charge of OpenAI and does the company still yeah. exist? You tell me. You tell me. Okay. Well, it's I'm crazy. But, it, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I think Sam is back in charge. But you know, it's been a crazy weekend. I think the, the short recap is on Friday the board decided that Sam Altman wasn't the right person to lead the company anymore. Uh, so then he left and uh, had some chat with his friends at Microsoft. Microsoft has a big share in OpenAI. I think it's forty nine percent, or it was forty nine percent back then. Uh, Microsoft decided that Sam and the other board member that left OpenAI could join Microsoft to, to start a new team there. Uh, when that rumor got out, a lot of the uh, staff at OpenAI decided to join both Sam and the other person. Um, new CEOs were appointed. Yeah. New CEOs didn't get answers from the board. Uh, and in the end, like roughly 90%, I think, of the staff of OpenAI signed a a manifest that stated something like, if, if the board will not resign and Sam doesn't come back, we will resign. So under that pressure, I think uh, in the end, Sam is back. Yes. So, but in a matter of really a weekend, the company almost came to an end because the board fired the CEO and out of the 700 employees, basically all of them were willing to walk. Um, but so the good news is there's other GPT players. So even if OpenAI did fail, uh, which is clearly not going to. I mean, Microsoft invested $13 billion into it, but there's some other alternatives, right? And so some of the ones that I've been uh, enjoying the most, I guess, is Anthropic. Um, and Anthropic, funnily enough, is actually a company that was started by some people who left OpenAI because they thought they were maybe pushing the boundaries uh, a little bit too much on, on not being private enough, not being uh, safe enough. And so they started a new company. And, and that company, the reason that I like it is because it's very easy to attach documents. Um, so, so one of my, my things with GPT has been the limitation of attaching a file or a large piece of text as context for um, some piece of work I need to do. And in Anthropic, you can literally go in and there's a plus button, an upload button. You can upload five attachments, 10 megabytes each, and then you can make those part of your generative experience. Um, so that's one alternative. Obviously, there's others. Um, Facebook has their own. Uh, the Llama model, that one is free for commercial use, which is pretty cool. Google has Bard, but Google also has Palm too. So uh, there's a lot of activity in this space. 
was certainly an interesting weekend with OpenAI um, and now back to normal. Uh, Niels, which other ones have you maybe played with and, and enjoyed? Yeah, I'm really looking forward to Gemini from Google. They originally planned to release this uh, by the end of this year, but most probably it's going to be the first quarter of the next year. But I expect that one to be really, really impressive. Um, Lama. What are they saying about it? What's, uh, what's supposed to differentiate it? Mm, that, that, as far as I know, it's all rumors. They, they don't really publish that much information on it. Uh, they, I think they're trying to really do an amazing job in fine tuning and um, training the raw model um, because um, basically with the LLMs, so the large language model, the training happens in two phases. First, you have like a raw training process that creates a model that is really hard to communicate with. But then you have an additional training phase is called reinforcement learning with human feedback, where you basically train the model to create answers and communicate in a way that we people understand and we uh, appreciate uh, um, in our communications. And I think Google is really trying to do um, a lot of effort in that part to make sure that the problems like, for instance, hallucinations uh, will disappear and that it will... Uh, comply with all regulations and doesn't provide any answers that people will take offense to. Um, but yeah, so because it's Google and they have a lot of data, a lot of machine learning expertise, and of course, on the computing power, I think uh, we can expect some uh, some interesting results from that. So I'm really looking forward to that one. But next to next to uh, uh, GPT, uh, I've been playing with uh, with Llama from, from Facebook. Uh, like you mentioned, it's, uh, it's open. So um, that one is interesting, but in my experience, it doesn't reach the level of GPT yet. I still think that you know, OpenAI has done a great job with the latest GPT-4, um, and I use I it a lot. Um, and then, I think we should actually tell people for a second, when, when you start explaining how Gen AI works, like you actually have a background in this, right? You studied this like, what, a decade ago? Oh, LLMs didn't exist. Back then, no, I studied artificial intelligence in the 90s. That was when uh, feed forward networks with back propagation learning algorithms were the real thing. If you compare it to neural networks these days, it's, it's been as what we did back then. But ever since I've been following all the, uh, the latest developments in artificial intelligence, uh, me and the other uh, alumni from, my, from the university, we're, we're in a group we're discussing different sorts of applications of AI technology. I've played around with it in search engine technology myself, back in uh, a Dutch search, and Dutch search engine called ilsa.nl. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still heavily involved with uh, a lot of uh, AI technologies, but I'm, I'm, I'm honestly, I'm flabbergasted with, with especially GPT-4. That was happening. Yeah, it's pretty amazing. And so uh, to, to give some context there too, right? So Llama from Facebook, um, the, the, all, the, all these large language models are basically trained on what they call uh, is it it's parameters or tokens, right? Which, which one is it? It's so like yeah, the, the model has X number of parameters that it's trained on. And right. so the Facebook one is relatively small. Then the Google one, Palm 2, is five times as big. And then GPT-4 is five times as big as the Google one. So it's 25 times the size of right. the Facebook one. And so hence, it's not that difficult to, to grasp why GPT is probably a little bit better. And then there's a ton of studies that are being done too right now, which basically look at what is the inflection point, or how many parameters do you need to train on before the model becomes like really uh, dem demonstrably good at certain tasks. And so that inflection point, so that Facebook is at that level where they've hit that inflection point, so it is quite good. But size does matter in these things, right? And that's why when you and I and, and anyone out there looks at how are we going to use these technologies and, and should we even consider building our own version of a large language model, which, by the way, is not that difficult to do anymore. I mean, there's a lot of open source out there that will let you do it. But to get it to be at the scale, to be of high enough quality, um, that's probably a losing battle unless you can also raise like $13 billion for Microsoft for your own venture like OpenAI did. Right. So, uh, yeah. So, so, but I, go ahead. Yeah. So, w w with respect to these base models, they are trained on an enormous set of data grasped from the internet. And like you mentioned, they have a lot of parameters that need to be 
tuned by the learning algorithm. And that is basically what makes it so expensive because if you have a trillion parameters and you need to update all the weights of these parameters, the weights in your neural network, uh, that is, that, that is computationally very, very, very expensive. So, but what you can do once the model has been trained, you can simply download these, the values for these parameters, the weights, if you will. And then you basically have a copy of the model that you can run on a local machine. So you have like, uh, there is a couple of open source uh, initiatives where you basically take, for instance, the Llama model, you download it to your laptop and you have a large language model running on your own laptop. So the training is very expensive, but then using the model is less expensive. And also something that's called fine tuning the model or extending the knowledge that is being used to uh, generate the answers. That is something that you can add on top of these base models so that you can basically create um, agents, if you will, or GPTs, as OpenAI calls them, that are specific to your needs. Yeah. And so I think there's a company called Hugging Face where you can look up sort of a, a ranking of these various models and they include the open source ones that you can then, as you said, make a copy of. Yeah, that's a great um, example. Yeah. So, and then I think, I mean, we are talking to a PPC audience. So one of the ways that I think about how does this all connect to search marketing? It's really about figuring out which model is the most effective for a certain task. Because the one thing we haven't talked about is that GPT-4 and GPT-4 Turbo, like the better the model gets, the more expensive it gets. And usually also slower. So if, you, if you've ever done a side-by-side -side comparison of a GPT-4 and a GPT-3.5, like GPT-4 is nice because you can actually read it as it's typing it out. GPT-3.5 will produce two pages like that, right? And then you have to sit there and read it. But if speed is of the essence, or if you're just needing like some basic keyword analysis, you probably don't need to spend the extra money on a GPT-4 model. So I think that's one of the ways that we as PPC practitioners can really help our clients by saying, okay, listen, this model is really good for keyword generation. Maybe we use that one for doing some ad text generation. But then if you want to write the actual landing page or a blog, then you need to have the best one. And maybe that's where we spend some money on using GPT-4. Yeah, I agree. But let's talk about uh, Dev Day, right? So what did OpenAI uh, announce and what is that next wave of the exciting things that are going to happen? So I, I wrote down a couple of things, but you just mentioned it, GPTs. Um, so tell us about GPTs and what those are. Right. Yeah, so I think it's a terrible name, but basically what they are, you, you can, I don't know why they call it GPTs. It's, it's like the word chat. Chat GPT in itself is already very <laughs> difficult to pronounce. But anyways, so GPTs are sort of like the your own version, mini GPTs that you can create. Uh, I've actually created some that we might demo in this uh, in this session if we got some time. Uh, but yeah, so basically your own GPT that is very specific to a task and you can feed it information about the knowledge that it can use to, in, in providing its answers but also, for instance, the style of communication that it uses um, uh, in its answers or the output. Uh, so for an example, um, if you have different two, let, let's say you have two completely different theories on how to write that copy, you could create an agent that basically you teach it both theories. So book A has theory A and book B has theory B. I can't put, come up with any favorite of famous authors like Robert, you feed it the, ad, the, the content of the book and then you ask it, all right, create some ad copy in the style of A and compare it to the uh, similar ad in style B and then start testing that in Google Ads. And that, that sounds amazing for PPC marketers and marketers in general because a lot of companies have sort of a playbook or a style guide or uh, brand guidelines. And so it sounds like this is something you could feed into your own version of GPT and get it to produce ad text and ad copy that actually resonates or that, that that's in line with your company stance. Um, and one thing that's interesting too about GPTs is a lot of what GPTs afford you to do would have been possible to do in the past, but it would have probably been a bit more challenging. You would have had to go into figuring out how to do fine tuning in context learning, uh, in context learning, especially when maybe you can't attach huge amounts of data. But GPTs, they are positioned by OpenAI as a, something that non-developers can use. So you don't need any technical skill to be able to do this. Uh, now, I know you have a lot of technical skill, but you did have a demo. So uh, show us what the average person could uh, achieve here. And, and then we'll take a look at what 
Niels can help you learn if you uh, you take his courses. Sure, let's try that. So yeah, basically what I did is I created, I've used the GPT builder to create my own specific GPT bot. And I've given it the name, the Google Ads Strips Sensei. And basically what this is, I've trained this GPT to help you create Google Ads Strips. Now what this allows us to do is create scripts that are pieces of JavaScript code that are specific to the Google Ads Strips environment. So I've fed it a lot of examples. I've fed it the documentation from the Google Ads Scripts Developer API, and I've added some custom instructions so that it creates code that is easy to understand and explains everything how it works to uh, the user of this uh, GPT bot. Now, what it can do is, I think, nothing but short of magic. So let's try something I've prepared this morning. I've created a flowchart which is an image. Well, actually, let me, let me show it to, to Fred. Ooh, so you're, you're doing multi-modality here, so not even a text input. You're, you're giving it an image. Exactly. And show us that image. So is that a whiteboard flowchart? Let me, you show, you, let me show you, Fred, because you, you're also a developer. So if you see this image, uh, you, you will probably understand what I'm aiming for, right? Yes. Yeah, awesome. Okay, so there's the flow chart. Uh, I can see in the top left that uh, you set a target CPA equals 100, and then uh, there's a flow chart happening. And my, <laughs> I, I'm glad you think I should be able to understand this, but I think anyone who does PPC hopefully gets this, right? So it basically has a big box on the left that says keyword stats from last 30 days. And then there's a decision box. And in one direction, it says if it's more than 100 clicks and zero conversions. And then there's a box that says pause the keyword. And then the other direction goes and says increase CPC bid. And there's a piece of text that's written on the whiteboard on the bottom that says uh, finish, send email only if change has been made. Um, okay, so all visual, nothing typed out. And so you gave this to GPT, to your Sensei. Right. So here I am in my Sensei, and I basically say, uh, create, I give it the instruction, create a Google, Google Ads script that automates this process. So I basically give it just simply a photo of the whiteboard and this instruction. There you go. So we, here we have the Google Ads Script Sensei. And so uh, for people who might just be listening on the podcast version, so it basically says, okay, we'll, uh, we'll have to break this task down into its subparts and a conceptual overview. Again, this is GPT talking to us, so this is what it's perceived from that image, but it says define a target CPA. Step two, retrieve the keyword stats. Step three, evaluate the performance criteria. And then it has like the two possibilities that were on the flow chart. And then number four, it says notification. Um, and then it says, now let's go ahead and translate this into pseudocode. And then it comes back with something that's you know, pretty close to JavaScript. Uh, and right. It is actually JavaScript, but it's not doing the, the functions themselves. And it's just basically the outline of these four steps. Exactly. So this is how I instructed this Sensei to work, because in my experience that I've also learned while giving training to other uh, Google Ads professionals that want to learn how to code. And there's an intermediary step, it's called the pseudo code, that uh, makes it a lot easier to understand what is possible, but also how the uh, final result will actually do the, uh, do the work and if it is doing, executing uh, the instructions in the way that you intended. Because no, so if, your, your human actually reads through this and and you should be able to make sense of kind of like the, the flow that's happening exactly. without worrying about technical details. Okay. So then if you yes. think this looks good, what happens next? Yeah. So, and the reason that I always uh, instructed to, to start with pseudocode is because if we are reading this, basically what it says for each keyword in the keywords, if the keyword clicks is above a hundred and zero conversions, then pause the keyword. That's okay. But then it says else. If the keyword has more than one conversions and the, tar and the CPA of the keyword is above the target, let's increase the CPC bit. 
but that's not what we want. Not what we want, right? We only want to increase the CPC bit if the actual CPA is below the target. So that's why the Tudor code can be helpful. So let's let's give an instruction. Um, Okay, so it's made a mistake basically from what uh, Niels had put on the whiteboard. So now he's putting in a message to GPT that basically says that for the most part it looks good, but that they only want to increase the CPC bid when the CPA is less or below the, uh, the target CPA. And th this is interesting because <laughs> you, you could skim through this pseudocode and it's literally just the directionality of the greater than, smaller than sign that's in the wrong direction. So it'd be very easy to get that wrong and say, ah, it looks good, go for it. Um, and now you'd be raising your bids for the things that already spent too much money. Right, so it understood it. it, it has corrected the mistake, and now it continues creating the JavaScript code. Now I'm gonna quickly scan through this to see if it actually is doing what is intended here. So you have to trust me on this, but um, I will also, I'm still working on the ultimate Sensei that will add a lot of comments so that you will not even need to know any JavaScript code. Yeah, so this is, this is good. So this is literally something that you can copy paste and run it in the Google Ads Scripts environment and it will work. So nice. we started off, we started off with simply this logic that you and your team created on, on the whiteboard. We took a picture, uploaded it to the, Google Ads Scripts GPT that I've created. And there you go. Here you have a Google Ads nice. Scripts that you can run in your account. Now, this uh, GPT that you've created, can other people use this or how do you distribute this? Or is this now for your team's use? Right. Yeah. Great question. So currently, this one is still um, private. And the reason for that is I've uploaded a lot of my own scripts in the instructions. And you can hack, currently you can hack the GPTs to basically rip the, uh, the original instructions out of this, uh, this bar. Uh, I think OpenAI is working on a fix to prevent this from happening. Uh, but I don't nice. want to share all my scripts yet. So. Yeah. And so you're kind of alluding here to copyright mm -hmm. uh, and exactly. protections for authors. And that's actually another interesting thing that was announced at Dev Days is that GPT or OpenAI is the company, they have something they call copyright shield. So when you use one of their off the shelf models uh, or the enterprise models, they will actually protect you in court. They will fight on your behalf if you get sued for copyright infringement. Um, so that should add a lot of comfort for people using GPT. Now, I, I think when it comes to custom GPTs, I'm not sure that those would be covered by the copyright shield. Um, and I think you and I both sort of feel that frustration because if you today go into GPT-4 and you ask, hey, can you write me a Google ad script? A lot of what it's learned yeah, is you. from stuff I've written, from what you've written, from what you know a handful of us have written. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and I'm actually quite happy. I mean, I think this is great for the industry that people can sort of push the boundaries. Um, I mean, I think it's fantastic. I, I think it just helps us as an industry evolve to that next level of PPC management. And we're all trying to figure out like, how do we optimize for performance max, right? It's, it's different from how you used to do things. And I think the more smart people who can start writing like little pieces of code and then getting scripts together and hopefully share those scripts back to the community, I think that's only gonna lead to uh, much better things for everyone. I agree. So, so the competitive advantage, it's definitely not in being able to, to write JavaScript. The competitive advantage is in being able to translate the opportunities of Google Ads script automations um, into uh, ideas. So coming up with ideas on, on how to improve ad copy using, using scripts, using the GPT API, coming up mm -hmm. with ideas on how to uh, use the GPT API to help you with, for instance, negative keyword mining, uh, search term report mining, so, yeah, I think it's, it's yeah. just, it's so fantastic. I mean, you and I both were saying, listen, scripts are a way for P anyone can automate their PPC accounts, uh, but there was still that need for a little bit of technical savvy and being able to put the JavaScript together or, or grab like pieces of your code and combine it with pieces of my code and then put a little bit of your own code. And like that's, that requires some programming knowledge, not a super high amount. And that's the classes that you basically do, right? You teach people how to get to that point where anyone can do it. 
But now with GPT, it's basically like you have your own private developer who's got who's ingested everything there is to know about your type of code. And you can have a conversation with that. And it's not just like, hey, here's the here's what you need to write, but you can actually have a back and forth and and, and it can make suggestions. It can say, hey, have you considered that maybe it's the wrong approach? Right. So one thing that I did was um, with OpenAI's advanced data analysis, uh, quote unquote, code interpreter, so that they've been naming this thing back and forth. They still call it code interpreter for the API, but they call it advanced data analysis if you're using the chat GPT capability. Uh, but this is a system that writes Python code. And so th this is great because you can have it ingest huge files of CSV of data from your account, your ads account. And then you can do things like say, hey, could you predict future ad spend based on the historical ad spend of these campaigns? And it'll actually talk you through different statistical analysis methods that it could use. And, and you can have a conversation. You can challenge it and say, I don't like that one. Suggest a different one. Um, or then it'll come back and it'll say, hey, did you notice that you have a little bit sparse data for these two months? So maybe your prediction is not going to be the most accurate. And again, this is the type of stuff where in the past, I would have had to sit with a developer or I would have had to do it myself. And then, you know, you email your developer, they get back to you the next day. And then the next thing you know, it's, it's two weeks to develop a simple methodology, right? But here, you can literally sit down at the computer with the GPT that never sleeps and, uh, and go through that same process and get something working within a couple of hours. It's actually, yeah, it's, it's literally like that. I remember doing some advanced data analysis that, you know, without GPT would easily take me two or three days, uh, days to actually implement this uh, regression model. And thanks to uh, the code interpreter, I was able to do it in a couple of hours and I had a working model with the regression analysis. It's crazy. Yeah. And also you mentioned, uh, yeah, it, it's a couple of weeks ago, I, I, uh, I ran a, an online workshop. It was a five day chat GPT and scripts challenge where me and, and roughly 40 people uh, were, were uh, using chat GPT to create scripts. It was a very nice experience, but I basically educated them on how you can use uh, ChatGPT to uh, get familiar with the basic concepts of JavaScript. So, for instance, what is a variable, what is a function, what is an object, etc. And once you have the basic understanding and you learn it in a playful way with ChatGPT, uh, how you then can create prompts that allow you to create these scripts with the use of ChatGPT. But now yeah. that you can build your own GPT, like the one I just showed you, the Sensei, you don't even need to learn how to create prompts anymore because the GPT right. developer has, has done that for you. Exactly. And then the other thing that was announced at Dev Day is the new GPT models are better at following instructions. Um, and so this is part of what you're talking about, right? It's like usually inside the prompt, you would have to specify the output that I need is a Google ad script. And sometimes it would do it, sometimes it wouldn't. But so these new models are better at following specific instructions. And so if you ask for it to come back in a certain uh, programming language, it will always give you back that thing in that programming language. So that, that's going to get better. Um, and then the other thing that I thought was really cool is the, the integration of uh, what's called function calling. Uh, they, they also sometimes call it tools and models. But basically, you can have these GPTs like what we've shown you now, right? What you just showed us was go and get some data from Google Ads. Now, the one thing is you've produced that code, but you still have to copy and paste it into Google Ads to do anything because the Google Ads data, that sits in Google and that doesn't flow into GPT. Uh, but there are now starting to be integrations where you can actually call outside of GPT and pull data back in. So if you think of, of a simple example, like if you wanted to have a conversation with GPT and ask it, what's the weather currently in Curacao? Well, it doesn't know because, and, and the latest model, by the way, has been updated to April, 2023. So GPT Ford Turbo is now through April, 2023, but still it doesn't know what the weather was today. How does it do that? How can you go to Google? How can you go to Microsoft and ask a question and actually get today's data back? Well, it's because it does that in context learning. So it reaches out to an external API and it says, give me the current weather temperature in that location. Um, but that's a structured call that has to go to like uh, weather underground or weather.com's API. That comes back and the GPT is able to use that JSON that comes back, pull out the temperature. And then that piece of information can now be part of the verbal response that it gives or the written response that it gives. 
Um, and this is really cool because temperature is a very easy example, but yeah, what if we could integrate and directly pull Google Ads data back in? What if we could pull in data um, and so you pull in your Google Ads data and you push it back out to Canva to do like this really creative ad design using the Dolly 3, which is now also in the API, right? So you start putting all these pieces together. And in the past, that was a lot of work because you had to literally like figure out did, did, if I want the temperature, I need this API. If I need Google Ads data, it's this API. But the system is just getting better and it knows, oh, that kind of data probably lives there and it goes and fetches it. And you can do multiple fetches in a single call. You can put it, push it back out. Um, so it's really amazing what you're going to be able to do in, uh, in short order here. Yeah, the innovation yeah. is going at such a rapid pace. Uh, literally, it's, it's, it's going to be hard to imagine what we'll be able to do a few months from now. Literally today, I discovered that there was a guy who was using the Zapier integration with an AI video tool. He basically shot a 30-second video of himself chatting like we are chatting right now. The platform did an analysis of his, the mimics of his face, his voice, and he was able to send data through Zap within ChatGPT, data through Zapier to the AI video generator, reintegrate the video in the chat, I use that, for instance, to send an email to his client where he himself, the AI-generated video of himself, was presenting the results of last month. I think that is just crazy. Nice. This is what is yeah. possible right um, now. It, it is a whole new frontier. And so it's interesting, too, because I think what you just showed us with the, uh, the Google Ad Script Sensei, that's basically kind of replacing what you do, right? Um, like what do you th what do you think we're going to be doing, say like a year from now? Yeah, hopefully we'll still be chatting, and then the bots are doing the work for us. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, but in all, yeah, in, in all seriousness, um, I think you know, like with the GPT assistance, um, the, the 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 unique uh, strengths that we have. And with, when I say we, I mean the PPC community, is that we understand how to translate business objectives into the search marketing opportunities, right? So search marketing still is something that is changing every day. The platform is changing, competitors are changing, your client is changing. Um, and the AI, the GPT assistants, they're just going to be tools in our arsenal, like, like for instance, specialized juniors in your team. So if you think of Think of all these AI assistants as specialized juniors in your team. You can simply build them with the GPT builder and things like that. Um, you'll be able to, to create much more value for your clients in less time, but you still have to come up with the strategy uh, that is uh, fed by all the, all the capabilities of all these different uh, AI assistants. So yeah. I think that is, that is where I see the biggest competitive advantage for PPC professionals in the future. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, at least for the, the next foreseeable future, you know, we're in charge of that strategy and, and still tell the machines uh, well, what, what it is you need to do to achieve that certain goal, right? And what are the steps involved in it? Because even as we saw in a simple example you just did, it got the directionality of like, is the target CPA good or bad? Like it got that wrong and it's pretty simple stuff. We can pick that out, but if you do it wrong, then yeah, you're going to waste money on your ads. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, so I live here in the Bay Area, right? And one thing that happened recently, which was very unfortunate and a little bit more severe than messing up a PPC campaign, but it was what happened with Cruise. Um, so Cruise is the self-driving car division from General Motors. It's headquartered in San Francisco. And if you go to San Francisco, all of these robo-taxis were running around, no driver in the front seat. Um, and I'm sure you saw this in the news, but a woman was hit by a car it was not a self-driving car. It was not cruise. And she got thrown into traffic. And there was a cruise car coming towards her. And that car, the, the automated car, braked three times faster than any human could have. So that minimized the impact for the, the woman. But then the woman got stuck under the car. And the car didn't sense this. And so the car's protocol, the car's strategy for dealing with an accident is to actually pull off to the side of the road to clear traffic. The poor woman was stuck below the car and got dragged 30 feet to the side of the road. And that's where most of her injuries were from. Um, 
And so, so kind of like two lessons here, right? Like you're saying, it's, it's about the strategy. How, what do you do if something goes wrong? Do you have all the, the right sensors in place? When that comes to PPC, like, are we looking at the right metrics? And that's where we often confuse ourselves, right? Like the example that you showed, like if your conversions are greater than zero, yeah, but what is a conversion, right? Are you measuring the conversion that actually matters for your business? So focusing more on like getting that right, and then the systems can automate handling that. That's good. So, but, but I think what, what we learned from this whole cruise example is we got to monitor the right things. We have to have the right strategies. We have to have some sort of like insurance in place so that if things go wrong, like it is handled correctly and the humans are there to step in to avoid things getting even worse. Um, and so I think we can learn across industries here. But those are some of the human roles that I see. And it's still very much in line with what I put in my book, the, the, the PPC doctor, the PPC pilot, and the PPC teacher. All of these super relevant in this open AI world, I think. Yeah, I agree. I mean, if, if, you know, we're the, we're the overlords. We have the oversight. And it is our job to, to make sure that the AI is not going haywire in the direction that we, uh, we would not want it to go in. I, I think the, what we see happening with a lot of the automations within the Google Ads platform that are powered by Google AI, like for instance, Pmax for smart bidding, uh, these clearly show that there's huge potential, but there's also at least a slight risk that you know the machine doesn't always perform in our interest or makes mistakes that are costly, and it's our job to to uh, to spot them. And that's really interesting because so we've talked about the mistakes, but the other point you're bringing up here is like the overlord and if the overlord in that case is google like it is google's interest that's being prioritized and not necessarily that of the advertisers and i think google oftentimes does have advertisers interests in mind but at the end of the day they're also beholden to the stockhold stockholders um and so that, that's an interesting point that you raise like whoever builds the ai is in charge of saying what the ai should do in certain situations so um no and that's what i think like, listen, we as a company, as Optimizer, we're never going to fight against Google. We cannot do AI better or in more real time than they can. They just simply have more money, they have more resources, and they can do auction time manipulation. And, and manipulation, not in a bad sense, but just setting the bids and like changing what the page looks like. We cannot do that. So the best that we think we can do is give you a layer of control back and say, okay, well, if Google did this thing, which they thought was the right thing, but we perceive it as being the wrong thing, then let's quickly go and correct some of the settings that we can to bring them back to where we need them to be. Basically, we're putting the guardrails in place and giving you control over those guardrails. Okay. Maybe, maybe that's the other interesting thing as, as people start using different GPTs built by different people, really understand like what's that person's motivation who built it, right? When, when it comes to nils, yeah, he's just trying to help the community and make all PPCers better so you can probably trust that. But if there's some person you've never heard about putting a script out there or a script generator in GPT, well, God knows, maybe the instruction for every one of these scripts is, oh, and at the end, send all the data to my email address, right? Now they have all your data. So exactly. be careful what you uh, what you look at. Yeah, this is actually a great example but because there are some scripts out there, especially some older ones that sort of like and have an integration with Google Analytics where every time the script is executed in the Google Ads platform, it pings the Google Analytics API telling the owner of that Google Analytics property that a script has been executed. Uh, it's not sharing any AdWords specific or Google Ads specific data with the, with the publisher of the script. But still, if you don't know code or you didn't ask ChatGPT to tell you what the code is actually doing, uh, then you might not see it. So. Yeah. And the nice thing, and you alluded to this, is you can actually get a piece of code and then you can, because it, it's like having a conversation with the developer, you could ask it the question, like, where is this data being sent? And it'll probably tell you there's this email address right there and this is what's being communicated back to it. Right. Um, so the same questions you would ask a human developer, ask your robot developer and get the answers you need. Right. I've actually shared a Google Doc with... Uh some GPT prompts that you can use especially for this. I will I will link to them in the in the comments. Uh, once awesome. This, uh, this is well, that's fantastic. Um, you know, crazy times, um, but I'm super excited. Sounds like you're super excited too. And, and do, you, do you have some more classes coming up to uh, to teach people how to do scripting and GPT? 
Definitely, yeah. So uh, four weeks ago, I ran this uh, five-day script challenge with ChatGPT. I'm going to repeat. It was a huge success, so I'm going to repeat it in February next year. So basically, what that is is five day, two hours per day online workshop where you and the other persons that are joining are going to use GPT to create uh, Google Ads scripts without the need to learn a lot of JavaScript. So you don't need to become a coder because we're going to have uh, GPT create a Google Ads script for us. Okay, so don't be afraid if you didn't have any technical skills, so long as you know a little bit of PPC. And where can uh, people find that? What's the URL? I will definitely link to it in the in the show notes, but uh, you can find it on my website, uh, which is my name, nilsremans.com slash JetGPT challenge. Great. Okay. Awesome. Hey, well, Nils, always uh, appreciate having you on the show and sharing some of the latest and greatest. Really love that custom GPT that you've built. Yeah, thank so you, thanks, thanks for having us. Me. Um, thanks for having me. Yeah. Enjoy your winter in Curacao. I will. Get some tan. Yeah. Make that head shine. <laughs> All right. And thanks everyone for watching and uh, we'll be back with another episode soon. So if you like this, go ahead and subscribe. See you on the next one. Take care.